So Genesis chapter 23. Now Sarah lived 127 years. These were all the years of her life. Sarah died in Kittith Araba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham went to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. Then Abraham got up from beside his dead wife and spoke to the Hethites. I am an alien residing among you. Give me a burial property among you so that I can bury my dead. The Hethites replied to Abraham, Listen to us, my lord. You are a prince of God among us. Bury your dead in our finest burial place. None of us will withhold from you his burial place for burying your dead. Then Abraham rose and bowed down to the Hethites, the people of the land. He said to them, If you are willing for me to bury my dead, listen to me and ask Ephron, the son of Zohar, on my behalf, to give me the cave at Machpelah that belongs to him in the end of his field. Let him give it to me in the, your presence for the full price as a burial property. Ephron was sitting among the Hethites. So in the hearing of all the Hethites who came to the gate of his city, Ephron said to the Hethites and answered, Abraham, No, my lord, listen to me. I give you the field. I give you the cave that it is in, in, is in it. I give, you, give it to you in the sight of my people. Bury your dead. Abraham bowed down to the people of the land and said to Ephron, in the hearing of the people of the land, Listen to me. Please, let me pay the price of the field. Accept it from me and let me bury my dead there. Ephron answered Abraham and said to him, My lord, listen to me. The land is worth 400 shekels of silver. What is that between you and me? Bury your dead. Abraham agreed with Ephron, and Abraham weighed out to Ephron the silver that he had agreed in the hearing of the Hethites. 400 standard shekels of silver. So Ephron's field at Machpelah near Mamre, the field with its cave, and all the trees anywhere within the boundaries of the field became Abraham's possession in the sight of all the Hethites who came to the gate of his city. After this, Abraham buried his wife in the cave in the field at Machpelah near Mamre, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. The field with its cave passed from the Hethites to Abraham as a burial property. This is the word of the Lord. Have you ever experienced what they call a mountaintop experience? A time so amazing, so fantastic, that everyday life just feels dull and drab by comparison. Maybe it was after a school camp, a Christian conference, or after seeing a spectacularly beautiful sunrise with your Bible in one hand. One of those times when you've felt like you've experienced God firsthand. Well, Abraham's just had one of those mountaintop experiences. Last week's passage in Genesis 22 was strange because it was spectacular and a little bit weird. And then we hit Genesis 23 and it just feels mundane. Every day. What does this have to do with anything? Why do we worry about the price of a cave in first century BC Canaan? But here we are, reading God's word, and here it is. After the events of Genesis 22, this passage raises an important question. It asks the question, where is God after the mountaintop? Where is he when the dust has settled? Is he still there? Or is he just waiting for the next spectacular moment to reveal himself? So as we scratch below the surface of Genesis 23 and have a look at what it has to say, please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you that you inspired every part of it and we pray that you'll help us to understand what you would have us understand from your word today. Amen. So last week we saw God explode in ex spectacular circumstances as Abraham was asked to sacrifice his child and then God provided a substitute. Well then, Abraham's life goes back to normal, or well, as normal as life can be after you've tried to sacrifice your child. And then, after a while of normality, we read at the start of Genesis 23 that Sarah, 
has passed away. After 127 years of life, after giving birth to a child in her old age by the grace of God, Sarah's time has finally come. And so now Abraham goes about the fairly normal task of looking for a place to bury his wife. This wasn't easy for him. He was a nomad. Every time, every piece of land that he walked on was owned by other people. He couldn't just bury his wife anywhere. You wouldn't want anyone just walking up and burying a body in, the back, in your backyard. He has to ask permission. He has to own a piece of land. But then something a little bit odd happens in this story. You see, in verses 18... And then again in verse 23, we're told that Abraham now owns this piece of land that he's just haggled for with the Hittites. Why are we told twice? Normally, when you're writing a story, you only say something twice when it's really important and you want your audience to remember it. Surely this whole chapter could be summed up by Sarah passed away, Abraham bought a tomb and buried her. But no, we have a whole chapter And we have to get told twice that the cave no longer belongs to the Hittites, it belongs to Abraham. Well, this seems inconsequential until we have a look and see where this tomb is. You probably can't see it there because of the stained glass window. But the cave is near a town called Hebron. Hebron is just south of Jerusalem and just south of Bethlehem, which means it is right there in the land that God had promised to give Abraham so many years ago. This is Abraham's first slice of the promised land. You see, ever since God called Abraham out of Ur, he'd been wandering with no land to call his possession, with the promise that God would give him the land that he was walking on and grant it both to him and his descendants. And now, here, with the death of Sarah, Abraham sees the first part of the fulfillment of that promise. Suddenly, part of the land that God promised to give him is his. He owns it. The Hittites don't own it anymore. We got told that twice. This is God's down payment. This is his deposit. This is God's message to Abraham. I've given you this much of the land. You can trust me to give you the rest. And so... Abraham goes, goes to his new field in the, new, in, the, in, his, in the promised land and he buries his wife. As he lays Sarah's body in the tomb, he hears a whisper, a whisper that says, God is faithful, God is working. Then, later on, the next year when he returns to the cave, to mourn and remember his wife, that same whisper echoes from the tomb. God is faithful. God is working. Many years later, Isaac will come to the tomb with the body of Abraham to bury his father. And as he does so, Abraham, Isaac too hears that whisper. God is faithful. God is working. And that whisper echoes through the land as God's people come and go from the land that God promised to give them. And they hear it. God is faithful. God is good. And then that whisper echoes through time. And suddenly it reaches another tomb. This tomb isn't bought. It's borrowed. And instead of a body in this tomb we see an angel, and that angel says, he is not here, he is risen. And suddenly we hear that whisper again, God is faithful, God is working. Just as God gave Abraham this piece of the promised land as a down payment, the resurrection of Jesus gives us our down payment. The resurrection of Jesus tells us you can be 100% certain that you will be raised after you die. Because Christ was raised, we will be raised. He is the first fruits. 
He is the guarantee, the down payment. Without him, nothing else happens. I hear you say, but Abraham had a tomb. He could go there and remember God's faithfulness any time he wanted to. The resurrection is great. We remember it at Easter. But do we have something more tangible, something we can go to every day? Well, God in his goodness has given us something. You see, 50 days after the whisper reached the tomb, it becomes no longer a whisper, but a roar that sounds like a rushing wind as the disciples gather and the Spirit comes and proclaims in a loud voice, God is faithful. God is working. As we heard from our reading in Ephesians, when you believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. He is the down payment of our inheritance for the redemption of the possession to the praise of his glory. God hasn't just given us the resurrection. He's given us the Holy Spirit as proof that he will bring us to new life in the new creation to live forever with him. As you were reading this passage, did you think you were going to see an amazing example of God's faithfulness to Abraham? Or did you just think that you were reading a nice story about first century practices of buying burial tombs? Well, see, the fantastic thing is, this passage is both. Because I don't know if you noticed, God isn't even mentioned in this passage. But that doesn't mean he's not there guiding it. You see, God didn't give Abraham his first piece of the promised land through a miracle, by parting the waters of the Jordan River, or through a great battle. God guided Abraham's negotiations, took him to the right point, the right city, to talk to the right people, and then helped Abraham as he haggled over the price. Just because God isn't mentioned in this chapter doesn't mean he's not there. He's the one making sure that it all happens, guiding things. And that's the way he continues to work for us. God doesn't often tell us his plans in great dreams, miracles or revelations. So often he works in the small, everyday things of life. You see, I'd never heard of the town of Narrabri until Bernard called me up to talk to me about a job. I was applying for a job in Tasmania, which I didn't end up getting. But the minister from Tasmania knew Bernard. And so he passed my resume along and said, hey, Bernard, I heard you were looking for someone. Chat to him. And God used that moment to show Alyssa and I that he would be faithful, that he would continue to look after us and that he didn't want us to minister in Sydney like we thought he did, or Tasmania, but he wanted us here in Narrabri. Now, God didn't tell this Tasmanian minister in a dream or in some spectacular revelation. No, he was just being nice to a guy who was looking for a job. And that very act of kindness was what God used to work and bring me here today. How have you seen God work in your life? Take some time to look back over those small moments because they are not luck or chance or serendipity or good fortune. They are God working in the small everyday moments of life to prepare you for the life to come, to shape you into the person that he wants you to be and equip you to serve him in his church. You see, just as Abraham could see the start of the fulfillment of God's promise to him every time he went to Sarah's tomb, we see the same thing every time we acknowledge that the Spirit is working in our lives, every time we remember the resurrection of Christ. And this means we don't need to be afraid of death because we know that Jesus was raised and therefore he will raise us. We don't need to be a slave to the self-help culture 
of constant self-improvement because we know that it is God who is working in us and through us to shape us to be the people that he wants us to be. We don't have to be petrified by the fact that we may not be good enough for God and that he may not let us into his new creation because the fact is Jesus has already made us good enough and the fact that God has given us his spirit is proof of that. We don't need to worry about what we'll say when our colleagues and friends ask us about our faith because God has given us our own stories. We can share with them the times that God has helped us. We can share with them the times that God has brought the right person into our lives at just the right time. We can share how God has made us more patient, kind, generous, loving. All we need to do is tell people what God is doing in our lives and God will use that for his glory. Our job now is to slow down and recognize those moments for what they are. One of the ways that I try and do that is to say praise God when somebody gives me a piece of good news because it reminds me and them that it's not luck or good fortune or hard work that has provided these good things. No, it is God in his faithfulness blessing us and showing us what life will be like in the new creation. We can see it clearly when those times at work or at home when we really should lash out in anger, but somehow we're patient. That is God working by his Holy Spirit to show us this is who you will be in the new creation. This is who I am making you to be. All those times when we're watching the news and we find ourselves saddened and grieved by the state of sin and death in the world, that is God working by his Spirit to say, A better world is coming. I am bringing a new creation where death and sin no longer are a factor. The whisper that Abraham heard first at Sarah's tomb, God is faithful, God is working, resounds through the promised land. It is heard by Isaac, and Jacob after him, until suddenly we see God the Son step into that promised land and say, God is faithful, God is working, and in his resurrection we are given the promise. We will be raised too. He is the the down payment. And suddenly that small tomb becomes the land, and that points us to the new creation that is coming. And the whisper becomes a roar as the Spirit comes to all who believe, all who are in God's mob, so that we can proclaim, along with Sarah, God is faithful. God is working, not just in the miraculous, but every day in ordinary ways to shape us into the people he wants us to be, to equip us to serve him and ultimately bring us to live forever with him in the new creation. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you that you work not just in the big moments but in the small and every day. And we pray that you'll help us to recognize them for what they are and show people how you work. Amen.